I would like to quickly point out that John the Mouse video has a large selection of videos from North and South America for your viewing pleasure. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Now let's get into the cheese of the matter. In this video, I started to look into the claim of the largest petrified tree in the world. Seems like there's petrified wood just about everywhere in the Northeast Arizona. And the world's largest petrified tree, they say, is in Dromino Trading Post. The tree is in several sections. And what I could find, it weighs 80 tons. It's free for you to see. It's just lying there right next to the parking lot, as you can see in the video. I think it's actually worth seeing. If you're on I-40, the exit is 280. It's on the north side of the interstate. Now for the ones that are putting in the comments that it's not the largest in the world, it's in Thailand. Let's take a look at that further. I have left links down below if you'd like to read more up on that. Now I can believe that it's the world's longest unbroken piece of petrified wood. It was found in Thailand back in 2003. The tree has a length of 236.9 feet and is 5.9 feet in diameter at the base. Just keep in mind that it is broken. I couldn't find the length that it's broken at. If you know, leave it down below. Let's look at some other petrified wood in the USA. Now most of these places you have to pay to get a look at the petrified wood. The first one we'll look into is in California. The Oakland Tribune from 1917 goes into describing a road trip in California to the petrified forest. He also describes some trees in the article. Queen of the Forest is 80 feet long and is 12 feet in diameter. The Menarch is 60 feet long and 9 feet in diameter. There is other trees that you can find there like the giant. That tree is 60 feet long and is six feet in diameter. Now all these trees are redwoods, all laying down the same direction from a volcanic explosion, seven miles to the northeast. That would put it behind the present day Mount St. Helena. These trees would have been covered with volcanic ash after the explosion. In Yellowstone National Park in Wyoming, you can find petrified forests that are standing upright. Funny thing about the trees that are petrified, all of them live in warmer climates with more precipitation. Let's ask Beth Taylor, the park ranger at Yellowstone, what trees are there in the petrified forest? Have you ever thought about time travel? Though the future may be hard to see, in Yellowstone, opportunities abound to glimpse the past. The petrified trees aren't lodgepole pines like the trees currently blanketing the park. Some of the petrified trees are sequoia, maple, dogwood, magnolia, walnut, hickory, oak, and breadfruit. Deciduous trees have a much warmer, wetter climate than we have here today. The volcanic nature of this place has been known to obliterate the landscape, and yet it has preserved some aspects for us to experience millions of years later. Please remember, it's illegal to remove any features from the park. Yellowstone belongs to all of us, and we hate to rob future generations of a rare peek at the past. Thanks, Beth, for the tree report. Yellowstone has had a lot of volcanic activities over the past that covered the trees with ash, mud, and other debris. Now, that's not the only petrified forest that lived in warmer climates. The oldest known petrified tree forest in the world is in New York, USA. Some 200 stumps were uncovered in the space that they were able to get to. I'm sure that there was a lot more in that riverside quarry that they couldn't get to 
in the time frame that they had to work with. The site has been covered up again as part of the dam reservoir that feeds water to New York City. Now a complete gabilla tree was found. It was 26 feet tall. They might be able to grow a little taller, but until they can find another one, that might be the max height. Now the roots remind me of a green onion. The base of the tree is larger with the roots coming out the bottom. Then you have the trunk. They think the trunk was hollow like bamboo, but the outside was like a palm tree and probably grew like one. Almost looks like a fern tree, but the flat branches act like a divided leaf. They also think this is the first tree forest that developed. And if this is true, this forest grew in the highest levels of carbon dioxide. Now from looking into these trees, it sounds like they were located along the coast of an inland sea that covered what is now the southern part of New York and western Pennsylvania. So my question is, did the sea level go down or did the land get higher? And what about having Florida weather? Think about that as I continue on with another place. Colorado has petrified redwood stumps up to 14 feet wide and thousands of detailed fossils of insects and plants. They tell a story of a very different prehistoric Colorado. There is at least 30 known stumps, but it is possible that there's still undiscovered stumps beneath the ground. Scientists are not actively searching for new stumps. Some of these stumps were buried in the late 1980s to protect them from weathering that takes place. I'd like to go over some information in the bulletin that I have linked down below. Notice the redwood rings are wider than modern day California redwoods. This shows that they are better had a better growing season than today's California trees. They also had other trees that grew in this area at the same time. Now these trees were also covered in the volcanic mud flow. This volcanic mud flow would have flowed like wet concrete over the land. And when it finally came to a resting stop, it would have turned into like a solid, like concrete. The rarest form of Montana petrified wood is called channel wood. This type of wood is black and white. What it lacks in bright colors, it makes up for in detail. The black reveals the unique wood grain, while the contrasting white quartz appears to drip through some of the ring growths. Visually, it looks much like the contrasting geometric shapes. The Smithsonian Institute has verified pieces of Montana channel wood as ancient sequoia trees, which were charred in a fire and then fossilized. It is the carbon from the fire that produces the black color. Just like the rest of the places I have pointed out, this place would have more like California weather but with more rainfall. The next part I'm going to be looking at are different things that have caused climate change to help explain why these places had trees growing there that don't live there now. As you probably noticed that a lot of these petrified places seem to have volcanic activities connected to them. I know what you're thinking that it's not a big deal. Let me tell you a little bit about volcanoes. These volcanoes can change the global weather from one eruption. It don't have to be from one volcano as it can work in a group of them like eruptions on the ring of fire. Now I know someone 
will put down in the comments that volcanoes only put out 2% of the CO2 compared to humans. That's not completely true. Around every 20 years or so, these volcano eruptions I was talking about will put out more CO2 than humans put out. But that's not the biggest issue. They throw out tremendous amounts of dust, ash particles, and several other gases that cause acid rain. After one of these eruptions, it shields out the sun. It takes about two years to dissipate all the particles from the event. During this time, it covers the globe to make it a global cooling event. I would like to point out a NASA article. The link is down below. The year without a summer. In this article, it talks about tens of thousands died because of destroyed crops. In New England and in Europe had a summertime cold snap that caused famine and soaring food prices. Between 1912 and 1963, there was no big volcano eruptions, but 1980 to 91, there was three big eruptions that they studied and they found out volcanic explosions will cause global cooling. Now, volcanoes are only part of the story of global climate change. We really have to talk about the tectonic plates that sit on top of the earth that makes up the crust. Everyone on earth is moving. Do you feel it? Two and a half to 15 centimeters a year these plates move. We have some of the oceans getting bigger and some of them are getting smaller. On land we have some countries that are getting pushed together causing them to get smaller but causing mountains to grow higher. You even have like California slowly stealing five centimeters a year from Mexico. From what I can tell, North America overall is moving west. Let me point out another article listed below on how scientists measure past movements. Because of the ocean floor magnetic striping records the flip-flop in the Earth's magnetic field. Scientists knowing the approximate duration of the reversal can calculate the average rate of the plate movement during a given time span. As all the continents move, it changes the jet stream and ocean currents. Will new patterns spawn a new ice age like we've had in the past? Now, I can't leave this without mentioning an asteroid striking the Earth. There seems to be some strong evidence that it killed off most of the dinosaurs and changed the global climate for years. I think a great video is made by Noah, Day of the Dinosaurs Died. I have a link to Netflix down below. This video also points to a, a time after the asteroid when the Earth had a very high CO2 from most of the fires burning the Earth and all the dead plants not taking CO2 out of the air. I'm showing you the world's best preserved meteorite impact site on Earth, Meteor Crater, that is nearly one mile across, 2.4 miles in circumference, and more than 550 feet deep. If you'd like to see the whole video, I'll leave the video card for you to click on. With these hitting the Earth, it really depends on where it would hit and how big would decide how much climate it would affect. Now, it could hit towards an edge of a tectonic plate, causing earthquakes, tidal waves, and volcanic activity. One thing seems very apparent is that the world is always changing and will always do so even when we are long gone. A few things I've learned looking into this topic. Man can't change any of these global changing events. But over the years, 
have learned to cope with the side effects by controlling the energy to heat and cool our homes. Even using that energy to water our crops, plant and harvest our food. We even transport our food to famine-stricken lands for people to survive on. During these times of reduced sunlight up for up to two years, and from the dust falling, it is apparent that solar panels are not the answer to heat our homes. This is where I think wind turbines will be a better option. Now, I'm not saying this is perfect because you know, the wind patterns, they'll probably change during this event and you might not receive any more wind or you might have less wind. Nuclear energy during these times would make more sense to me during these conditions. As you can see, we have storms that already put the water up several feet high and push people out of their homes. What happens every time the water goes back down? People move back. They learn to adapt. They rebuild their life to what they had before the flood, or maybe even something better. One way is that they build their homes on stilts or put them on higher ground. Even houses that are next to rivers that flood every other year, they have done the same thing. 2019 has been a very wet year for a lot of people across the USA. Many creeks, streams, and rivers have flowed over their banks. This is nothing new. It has happened in the past and it will happen again in the future. I think the most important thing to take out of this is oil has helped save millions of people from dying. There are so many things made from oil that it needs a full video just to talk about it. Just think about everything that has plastic in it. Most of our plastics are based on a carbon atom that generally is coming from oil, natural gas, or coal. If you'd like to go back to the horse and buggy days, leave a comment about it down below. I might make a video talking about it, my take on that. So where is the largest petrified tree? John the Mouse travel map is available for Google Maps. It will help plan your route to the locations of your favorite videos. It is free to use. I have the link below. Please visit the playlist tab for videos that I have sorted for you. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button 